Knowledge is power. And in StarCraft, the things you don't know about structures could mean the difference between winning and losing. Hi, I'm Alticate and I'm gonna teach you how to play StarCraft 2. In my videos, I often talk about the importance of game knowledge. In this video, I'll talk about the different types of structures in StarCraft 2, the general principles of how they work, and more importantly, how you can use those principles to win games. In fact, at the end of this video, I'm gonna show you how you can defeat your opponent simply by moving a structure from one spot to another. This is a situation so unlikely, so obscure, that I've never seen it happen in 10 years of playing and watching StarCraft 2. It's even possible that in all the millions of games played so far, no one has ever pulled this off in a real game. But before we get to all of that, we need to ask ourselves a very simple question. What is a structure and how is it different from a unit? Units and structures have more in common than you might think. They both have health, and both can cast spells using energy. Structures have vision of their surroundings, and can be given orders. Some structures can even move or attack. The key things that set structures apart from units are that they are created by workers, do not need supply to be constructed, and must be placed according to certain rules. Structures also have unique capabilities that are not available to units. They allow you to collect resources, build units, research upgrades, and unlock more advanced technologies. But there is another way structures differ from units, and this is something so fundamental it's often not talked about. Only structures can win games. In StarCraft II, the only way to defeat an opponent is to eliminate every single structure they control. The reason why we never talk about this is simple. 99% of all games end with one of the two players surrendering from an unwinnable position. Usually this happens when a player no longer has any chance of ever producing an army that can defeat the opponent's forces. But there are situations where both players still have an army, but rather than engage each other head-on, they attack each other's bases. This is called a base trade scenario, or a base race, as in a race to wipe out the opponent's structures before losing all of your own structures. In a base trade, knowing exactly how StarCraft II's win condition works can mean the difference between winning and losing. To stay in the game, all you need is a single structure of any kind. It can be under construction, unpowered, uprooted, or flying. Regardless, the moment you lose your last remaining structure, you immediately lose the game. Your opponent could have the most powerful army ever assembled in StarCraft history, but if you can somehow snipe their last remaining structure with a single marine, you win. To win a base trade, there are two things to keep in mind. The first is cost. The more structures you can build, the longer you can stay in the game. But base trade scenarios usually leave one or both players starving for resources, so you'll want to build the cheapest structures possible. Supply depots, pylons, and extractors are all common choices here. The other thing is placement. You'll want to put your structures out of your opponent's reach. Terrans can lift structures off, either stashing them in corners of the map only air units can reach, or keep them with their army. Zerg are limited by creep when placing structures, but have a great tool in spine crawlers and spore crawlers. These defensive structures can be uprooted, letting them walk freely across the map like a ground unit. Keeping a spine crawler in the middle of your army is a great way to win a base trade. To keep base trades from getting out of hand, StarCraft II has a mechanic to prevent that. The reveal rule. If a player loses all of their command centers, nexuses or hatcheries, a timer starts ticking down from 18 seconds. If the player doesn't start constructing a new command center, nexus or hatchery before the timer runs out, they will be revealed. This means all of their remaining structures will be visible through the fog of war on the opponent's minimap. If the player starts construction of a new command center, nexus or hatchery, the reveal condition will be lifted and the game goes back to normal. Now that you know how structures win games, let's talk about the next step. How to control them. Selecting structures works mostly like selecting units. Left click a structure to select it, hold shift and click a structure to add it to your current selection, hold control and click a structure to select all structures of the same type on the screen, and hold control and shift to add all structures of the same type on the screen to your current selection. 
but there are some important differences. A selection box that includes both units and structures will only select units. And even if there are no units in the selection box, only one type of structure will be selected, according to a preset priority. For example, for Terran, the priority goes Command Center, Supply Depot, Barracks, Factory, Starport, and so on. This priority is also reflected in the information panel at the bottom of the screen when you have multiple types of structures selected. If you want to select a lot of structures at the same time, the fastest way to do so is to hold down the shift and control keys and click one structure of each type. Just like units, structures can be part of control groups. As I mentioned in my macro video, players usually use this to keep track of their production structures. You can have all kinds of structures in the same control group, but you can only give orders to one type of structure at the same time. For example, if you have barracks, factories and starports in one control group, the barracks will be active by default. Use the tab key to move down the priority from barracks to factories to starports and back again to barracks. This way you can quickly issue orders to multiple types of structures. Efficient control of structures is a key skill in StarCraft. But first, you have to figure something out. What are you going to use them for? Different structures have different functions. Broadly speaking, these are economy, supply, production, technology, and defense. Economy structures allow for the collection of resources. The command center, nexus, and hatchery are sometimes collectively called town halls. This term goes all the way back to Warcraft 2. Town halls are unique in that they provide a collection point for gathered minerals and Vespian gas. This might seem obvious, but it's important to keep in mind that if your last town hall is destroyed and you don't have enough minerals to construct a new one, you won't be able to collect any more resources for the rest of the game. The other type of economy structure is very simple in function, but often plays a central role in early game build orders. The gas gathering point, refinery, assimilator, and extractor. Economy structures are closely tied to the next function we'll talk about, supply. Supply structures add to your available supply. Supply depots and pylons each give 8 supply, town halls all give 15 supply, except for the zerg hatchery, which only gives 6. But remember that zerg start with an overlord, a unit which gives another 8 supply for a total of 14. Terran and Zerg can upgrade their town halls, but this has no effect on the amount of supply the structure provides. Constructing a supply structure will add to your existing supply. If the structure is destroyed, the supply is lost. If this causes your used supply to be higher than your available supply, your supply numbers will display in red text. This has no effect whatsoever on your existing units, but you cannot make more units until you raise your available supply. Next, let's talk about what you're going to use all of that supply for. Production. Production structures build units and research upgrades. These structures have two important features we need to talk about. The first is the production queue. Production structures have a production queue with five slots. When you order a structure to build a unit or research an upgrade, it's added to the first available slot in the queue. If you have multiple structures of the same type selected, the order will be executed by the structure with the shortest available queue. If you made a mistake, you can cancel the last item in the production queue by hitting the escape key. If you want to cancel a specific item, left click the relevant icon in the production queue. Canceling an item in the production queue will immediately refund the full cost of the unit or upgrade. Also, if a structure is destroyed, all units and upgrades in its queue are immediately cancelled and their full cost is refunded. The production queue is an amazing tool that helps players optimize their production by eliminating idle time, but it should not be overused. The cost of a unit or upgrade is paid the moment it goes into the queue. This is money you could use for other things right now. One of the keys to great macro is to time your production cycle so that you make only minimal use of the production queue. Not all production structures have a production queue. This is a mechanic that Terran players have to pay by far the most attention to. In future videos, I'll go into more detail about each race's unique production cycle. Macro is all about producing units as fast as possible, but that leads to an important issue. How do we get our units to where they need to be? All production structures except the warp gate have a rally point. 
The rally point is the target location where units produced in the structure will go after they are created. Each structure has its own rally point, and if none is set, units will spawn right outside the structure. Your starting town hall's rally point will be preset to the nearby minerals, but for all your other structures, you will have to set the rally point yourself. To set a rally point, select a structure and simply right click any location on the map or the minimap. Zerg hatcheries have two rally points, one for drones and one for army units. Right click a mineral patch or extractor to set the drone rally point and any other location to set the army rally point. You can set the rally point of multiple structures at the same time, and even unfinished structures can have their rally points set. Zerg eggs inherit their rally point from the hatchery when they're made, but you can manually set the rally point for each egg after it starts morphing. Queens do not have a rally point and will always stay right next to the hatchery. A rally point can be a location, a unit, or even a structure. If the rally point is a location, the new unit will move to that location before awaiting additional orders. Keep in mind that this is a move command, so the unit will ignore enemy units on the way, even if it's attacked. Workers that are rallied to minerals or a refinery, assimilator or extractor will automatically begin harvesting resources. A structure's rally point will be reset if it targets a unit or structure that has been destroyed. If you want to manually reset the structure's rally point, select the structure and right click itself. So how should you use rally points? For workers, rally your town halls to the nearby minerals, but update the rally points as your bases are fully saturated to send new workers to your newest expansion. For army units, the purpose of the rally point is to concentrate your reinforcements in one place. The location of your rally point depends on the state of the game and will change over time. At the start of the game, you should rally units either through your ramp or to the front of your natural expansion. When you get deeper into the game, a good rule of thumb is to rally your reinforcements to a point midway between your second and third bases. There are many exceptions to this rule, but this is just something you'll have to figure out as you play the game. I'll talk more about rally points and more advanced ways of using them in a future video. For now, let's look at the type of structures that make other structures possible. Tech structures unlock more advanced structures, units and upgrades. Before you can construct a Twilight Council, you need a cybernetics core. Dark Templars are built from gateways or warp gates, but also require a dark shrine. Together, these game rules are called the Tech Tree, and each race has its own. To unlock its technology, a tech structure has to be completed, but it can be damaged, unpowered or lifted off without causing any issues. If a tech structure is destroyed, you'll no longer be able to make the things it gave access to, but structures, units and upgrades already under construction can still complete. However, units and upgrades that are queued up will be cancelled. Some tech structures also grant abilities to units, like the Terran Armory, which allows Hellions to transform into Hellbats and makes the Widow Mine invisible while it's reloading its weapon. If the Armory is destroyed, these abilities are lost. It really pays to know the tech trees. Some of the rules are pretty obscure, like the fact that you need to have a nexus to build a gateway or a forge. But if you play this game long enough, sooner or later that useless bit of trivia might win you the game. Defense structures like photon cannons, bunkers and shield batteries can be used offensively, but their primary function is to increase your resistance to early aggression. Defense structures are highly cost effective when compared to units, but at the price of giving up mobility. Each race has its own set of defense structures, and they are quite a bit different. The Terran bunker must be filled with units from the barracks to do damage, the Protoss shield battery automatically restores the shields of nearby allies, and the Zerg spine crawler can be uprooted and moved from one spot to another. Each race also has a defense structure that is also a detector, meaning it will reveal cloaked and burrowed units within its radius of vision. The missile turret for Terran, the photon cannon for Protoss, and the spore crawler for Zerg. All of these structures can also attack air, but only the Protoss photon cannon can attack both ground and air. Defense structures provide fighting power without using up supply. This can be important when the game goes long and armies are maxed out. You'll sometimes see Terran players spam missile turrets around the map in the ultra-late game to protect their forward positions against enemy air units. 
Now that we know what structures can do for us, the next step is obvious. How are they made? Each race has a slightly different method for constructing structures, but they all follow the same two rules. You need a worker to make them, and you have to pay for the structure before it can be started. Terran structures are built by SCVs. The SCV is not available for harvesting resources during this time, and it's also vulnerable to enemy harassment. If the SCV is killed, construction of the structure will be halted until another SCV can take its place. Proto structures are warped in by probes, but after this process is initiated, the probe is free to return to harvesting or other tasks. Zerg structures are mutated from drones, and the drone is consumed in the process. While under construction, a structure's vision is limited to its immediate surroundings. Against Protoss and Zerg, this can be exploited by hiding units or structures nearby. A structure under construction starts at 10% health and rapidly gains health until reaching 100% when the structure is complete. If the structure takes damage during construction, this damage will remain afterwards. A structure that has 1000 health but takes 300 damage during construction will start with 700 health. If a structure is destroyed during construction, no resources are refunded. At any point during construction, you can cancel the process by hitting escape. Regardless of how far along the construction was, you'll always get exactly 75% of the resources spent back. If you cancel a Zerg structure, you'll also get your drone back. Cancelling comes at a cost, but sometimes it's the right choice to make. If the structure comes under attack and you won't be able to save it, cancel the structure to get some of the invested resources back. Instead of cancelling, Terran has the option of halting construction. To do this, select either the SCV or the structure itself and hit the T key. This frees up the constructing SCV for other tasks. At any time, you can resume construction by selecting any SCV and right-clicking the halted structure. There are some structures that are not constructed by workers, and two of them are worth a special mention. The Terran Reactor and Tech Lab are collectively known as add-ons, and can be constructed by any barracks, factory or starport that doesn't already have one. Once the add-on is complete, it will be attached to the structure that built it. However, add-ons are interchangeable, and by lifting off the attached structure, you can swap another barracks, factory or starport into the same spot. In fact, add-ons are so interchangeable, by landing a compatible structure next to an enemy add-on, you permanently seize control of that add-on. Structures must be placed on the build grid, an invisible grid of square tiles the game uses to decide where structures can and cannot go. Structures must be built on flat, unoccupied ground, which means no ramps, no cliffs, no water, and so forth. Each structure also has its own footprint. Most take up 3x3 three three squares on the grid, but town halls cover 5x5 five five tiles, and some structures are smaller. Additionally, refineries, assimilators, and extractors must be placed on a Vespian geyser, and town halls cannot be placed too close to minerals or Vespian geysers. Friendly units will automatically move aside to make room for structures, unless they're carrying out a hold position or patrol command, or otherwise cannot move. The same is not true of your opponent's units. In fact, by placing a unit at a certain location, you can deliberately block your opponent from placing structures there. You also cannot place a structure on a space occupied by another structure. A common way to exploit this is to place a structure at your opponent's expansion, to prevent them from constructing a town hall there. Also, Protoss and Zerg each have their own restrictions for placement. Proto structures must be placed in a psionic matrix, the energy field generated by pylons. The only exceptions are the Nexus, Assimilator, and Pylon. If the pylons powering a structure are destroyed, those structures will become unpowered and cannot build units or research upgrades until power is restored. Zerg structures must be placed on Creep, except for the Hatchery, Extractor, and Nidus Worm. Creep is Creep no matter who made it, so you can place your own structures on the Creep covering your opponent's base if you want. However, Terran and Proto structures can never be placed on Creep, although they won't suffer any negative effects if Creep later covers their location. When placing a defense structure such as the Photon Cannon or Missile Turret, a white ring appears around the structure. This indicates the structure's attack range, or in the case of the Shield Battery, its healing range. Now that we've established how structures get built, let's get to the fun part, blowing them up. 
Just like units, structures have a health pool. Compared to units, structures are generally very tough. Most have hundreds of health, and many have over a thousand health. All structures are also armored, which offers them protection against most attacks, although they also take bonus damage from units like the Marauder that do extra damage to armored targets. Terran structures that are reduced to below one-third health will start to burn. Burning structures lose health over time and will eventually be destroyed. But Terran structures are also mechanical, which means that they can be repaired by SCVs. Structures under construction never burn, no matter how much damage they take. Protoss structures have health and shields, just like Protoss units. Damage to a structure's shields is regenerated over time, but damage to a Protoss structure's health can never be restored. Zerg structures slowly regain health over time, but Zerg structures that somehow end up off creep will start to lose health and will eventually die unless they're brought back onto creep. Zerg structures are also biological, which means the queen can use its transfusion spell to heal them. When destroyed, most Zerg structures spawn broodlings that will automatically attack the opponent's units. Part of game knowledge is to be able to identify different structures by sight. As I said in my video about scouting, the structures your opponent has in their base tells you a lot about what they're planning to do. The good news is that structures in StarCraft 2 are all pretty distinct, so it doesn't take long before you learn to recognize them all even at a glance. That said, structures do have different skins that can be unlocked by players, allowing them to slightly change the appearance of one or more of their structures. When it comes to structures under construction, how much you can tell by sight depends on the race. You can always tell how large the structure is going to be and roughly how far along the structure is towards completion. But for Zerg, that's about it. For Protoss, the shape of the structure becomes apparent only in the final few seconds. And for Terran, you can tell exactly what structure it is from around 70% completion. The other consideration is whether a structure is producing units or upgrades, transforming into another structure, or is sitting idle. All production structures have some sort of animation that shows it is building units or researching upgrades, but you usually can't tell more than that. There is one exception, the Proto Stargate. By looking closely at the shape of the warp in the Stargate, you can tell exactly what unit is going to come out. Earlier, I said I would show you a way to defeat your opponent simply by moving a structure from one place to another. If you've been paying very close attention to everything I've said in this video, it's possible that you've already figured out how this could happen. The answer to this puzzle has to do with the game's win condition and the way Terran add-ons work. Like I said before, add-ons belong to the player who built them, but they can't be taken over by another player if they're abandoned by their owner. If your opponent's last remaining structure happens to be an add-on, landing a compatible structure next to that add-on would remove their last remaining structure in the game. And that's GG. If you found this video valuable, I'd be super grateful if you could hit the like button and leave a quick comment as it really helps the video reach more people. I have a lot more content planned for StarCraft, but I also make videos about game design and retrospectives of games like Final Fantasy and more. If you want to help a tiny channel grow, consider subscribing. Subscribing is totally free and it's the best way to support what I do. Thank you so much for watching and have a fantastic day.